point there was such a high transmission. So that showed that it was really important to control for that spread once the, um, the, the cases, the community transmission had been implemented. And this is also a small study, but also an example of the reserves that, that matters here. So you can, you, everybody knows the importance of the PPEs. And uh, in, in a climate with very high temperatures and humidity, the comfort of, of working for the health workers, working with these PPEs is probably uh, uh, even worse than in other countries. So uh, Anna uh, did has this project to try to see whether with, with cooling vests, uh, with pockets with eye packs, that uh, had any impact on the cognitive function of the health workers and improve thermal comfort and the sensation of comfort. And these are some uh, results of this project, which I think is small but was very, very important. And then uh, that happened everywhere that there was a, a very strong pressure on the hospitals, but also in terms of outpatients, because it's not only the virus, but the fear behind the virus. So there was this concept of virtual work that happened in many uh, countries, high-income countries. So here in the Gambia, the, the, there was established, and the clinical service department established a virtual work with our staff, in order to try to mitigate this pressure and to, at the same time, be able to respond to fears and to talk to the um, staff. We, first, it was through telephones, and then it was the nurses, and only when it was really necessary, then things passed to the, to the research clinicians. And what this study, it was an implementation, but then it was also published to show that actually this virtual world that had worked in many countries, in, in high-income countries, it was feasible in the region as well if there was the resources that were needed for this to be implemented. But this was also very important because it, uh, it created uh, as we have more than 1,000 staff at the unit, and this was kind of a court that had a systematic surveillance of symptomatic cases and also the contract tracing. Uh, whether the transmission actually that was reflected in the region was what was happening, or was from our court, the MRC court, we cleared those that were in direct contact with the cases, so we considered that the risk of infection in our staff was similar to the rest of the population, and we have our staff spread in the, camp, in the Gambia as well, more or less in the same distribution that, that the population. And then what we saw, if you look at the left uh, figure, you can see that the per this is in, in the Gambia, the whole, the percent. So it was extremely high. And in the right hand side, you, we can see the bars that are the number of cases in red in the Gambians at population level, but the, the dark green is the incidence in our core at the MRC, that it was more than 80 times higher. Probably there had been more than 75,000 just among adults, that because it was our age group. So this study uh, was very important to see that systematic surveillance, it was required if we wanted to really understand the, the extent of transmission that was happening in community level. So um, then al alongside with our data, there, there was some data coming from zero surveys studies, especially I think the first paper came from Kenya showing that actually the transmission had been much higher than expected. There, there was a paper on uh, healthcare uh, workers that the transmission among them was more than 50% in Eastern Africa. And then we saw the importance of these zero surveys in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we used uh, a, a study that, we call, that is called PRECISE, uh, and we used the samples from this study that had been running for, for a long time to see whether uh, the, we can also see, not only from the MRC, that there's always a limitation that is a special population, but also in the community, whether the transmission was as high as we had shown in our, in our court. So uh, this study is in, uh, they are representative of the full population, is always a question mark. But we have more than 100 samples pre-pandemic. Uh, and this is an error, sorry, it's not 25 samples. It's 125 samples uh, pre uh, first wave, and then post first wave, post second wave, and post third wave. And actually, the results, sorry, because this is not the last version, but the results show 
that actually these are the bars in uh, purple, the prevalence of infection in the different waves. And you, we can see that there is no lack of specificity, that there were a lot of papers saying that maybe the African samples were poorly specific of the population were seropositive, more than 60% after the second wave and 90% after the third wave. And this year, to see uh, the extent of, tra of transmission, but of course, that's, so this 90% was before the Omicron uh, variant that arrived in the Gambia. So, what happened with this very high transmission? A question about the HDSS, the Health and Demographic Surveillance System, HDSS, for many years. And what we did is was an analysis, an interrupted time series analysis to see whether there was any increase of mortality after, the, the, after starting the, um, the, the first wave in the Gambia. So we compared the expected mortality looking at the pre-pandemic years, five years from 2016 to 2019. When you look at the overall mortality, our health age, when we put all age groups together, there is no excess mortality. So even though that we have seen now that there is this uh, very high transmission, we haven't seen any excess mortality. Uh, there was the state of the emergency and the country was closed. The analysis of 2021, that is the Delta variant, is now ongoing. But then when we look there is some excess mortality among infants. Uh, is that the, in red, you can see the, in, the more death than expected. Uh, and then in, in Farafeni, there is some excess mortality as well in red, in the, in the red, among individuals 65 years and older. So some vulnerable age groups might have been at risk of excess uh, death in the Gambia. So this is very important in terms of the public health response, that there are some vulnerable groups that need to be considered when, uh, co when thinking also in terms of the potential collateral damage of any inter in intervention that happens in, con in, in um, regions public, uh, with weak not only the Gambia, but also uh, in collaboration with Burkina Faso. We have uh, here um, the scientists from Burkina Faso that are also part, apart from Amnet, uh, of this study. And this study was, it has many objectives. I said before, I cannot go into the detail. Dynamics of a court of patients that were, uh, when they were positive, they were followed for six months and they were sampled over six months to see the dynamics of antibodies. And this, the, the timelines of this study was uh, the, during the first and the second wave, the recruitment. And then uh, another important objective of being in different samples, but the results are still not here and I know that they are uh, in preparation. This is another important study that is called Transvir, that the way the individuals are selected is completely different, so the households are, are randomly selected and then are followed. Uh, to look at these studies to determine incidence of asymptomatic and symptomatic respiratory viral infections or with different viruses, and then look at factors that are impacting infection and transmission dynamics such as age or also uh, uh, prior mucosal and systemic immunity. And then a uh, very important aspect of this study is all cellular and uh, all cellular e immunity to, um, and response to the virus. The important, another important thing that also goes in accordance to the other data that I've shown is that uh, the baseline that when the recruitment of the participants for this study happened, that was between April and August 2021, that was after the second wave, then the the baseline prevalence of zero prevalence of these individuals was already almost 60 percent and actually there was some variations uh, by age and some another in, uh, important point is that uh, there's some specific cell response that is observed among individuals that are zero negative so it's still uh, more um, more infection. So this is what we call the PATS trial, and then the PATS trial is prevention and treatment for COVID-associated severe pneumonia in the Gambia, and is a single-blind randomized trial. So at the beginning, those that need beds that need oxygen, and also to decrease transmission in the community, and then among the severe uh, ones, of course, also to the decrease progression into death. And then this study was designed into two cores because one core was from mild and moderation and transmission in the, in the household. So the household contacts are also part of this study. And then the other the core two uh, is those that are already hospitalized with oxygen and trying to um, decrease progression into uh, CAP and, and, and death. So what we know new is that different. 
For core one, that non-severe, we use ivermectin, and we have already finished one core one and core two. We finished the recruitment, but we still don't uh, bro broken, have not broken the code. For, for core one, we were using ivermectin, and for core two, our initial idea was to use dexamethasone, but then the recovery, the results of the recovery trial show that the dexamethasone decreased mortality. So it was not, even though the, the study was done in the UK, but it was not possible not to use uh, low dose of dexamethasone among severe patients. So then we changed uh, the, um, the um, uh, drug for aspirin, uh, and then we just finished the recruitment. Um, then now what we've done is we are not, PATS has finished in terms of recruitment, but these severe patients, now we are part of the recovery international and we are comparing a standard dose of dexamethasone versus high dose of uh, steroids dexamethasone among very severe cases. Uh, it was very difficult, especially at the beginning, to work on a trial, and I think has been discussed before about the, the vaccine. We did this social science study to try to understand what were the community's fears and to try to increase the trial participation. And then we did this qualitative study with some structured interviews and focus group discussions. And we really found that there was a lot of fear of stigmatization, and we had to adapt a little bit our uh, methodology to preserve the pre really trust the MRC, and that helped. Um, there is an error on the percentage of death, but it's, it's lower. But is this, I just want to highlight uh, the difficulty on recruiting because people didn't want to get tested, but also if you look at those that were uh, mild and, uh, and moderate, the progression, progression into severe pneumonia was really low, much lower than expected. But those that were severe, that were at the same time very high mortality among those severe. For us, the importance of this patch trial is not only the, to evaluate the intervention, but is that we have a course of individuals that go from asymptomatic household contacts to mild and moderate, and then severe and very severe, and then death. So we are able to have, because it's part of a trial, we have a strong clinical data that in the context. So we know the main risk factors that have the, the screening is also a very important uh, aspect of the patch. And this is just an example of some of the things at the beginning. The, uh, it was actually the first two reinfections were amongst uh, variants that were very similar between them. In, in gray the, the, and in blue and the other colors are the ones that are different. So um, really the two variants that infected the same people that were healthy adults were very, very similar. And this is, uh, this is just uh, a, a, a very early data, but just to show, so in terms of the, there are hypotheses on gut microbiome and dys dysbiosis, how these affect the risk of severity. And then there are some hypotheses that, um, uh, so the, this dysbiosis might contribute to the hyperinflammatory immune response for severe cases. And this, this hypothesis from the gut microbiome comes home from ecological studies comparing uh, countries rather than specific um, sick individuals. So what we, our hypothesis was that if we compare uh, the, our mild and moderate cases versus our severe, we will probably find a difference of uh, the, this, the um, amount of anti-inflammatory yes, for the differences in age and antibiotic consumption, but actually the results that we find with here in blue and green is that they're working on a proper analysis for this. And this is just the, the last study that I want to show. But there's been some data in, in the UK, for instance, there's quite a lot of data that with the behavioral interventions of uh, decreasing the social contact, it has affected also other respiratory viruses. There's been no flu or no RSV for one season at least. And then what we wanted to see here whether the same pattern was observed. And actually what we observed here is that not the respiratory viruses have continued to circulate. Uh, in the expected peaks, uh, and this is very important, also looking at virus-virus interactions, and this is very important in terms of the transition now from epidemic to an, an endemic virus. And just for this analysis, we've used the surveillance in the different, in, in Fajara, the surveillance in Keneva, but also we use the surveillance that we did in, as part of PATS 
to extend then, uh, this, this surveillance of respiratory viruses to, uh, to at least two years. So just as a conclusion, I think the unit in collaboration, strong collaboration with the Gambian government has been keen describing the, the epidemic in this, uh, in this region, in the Gambia specifically. And uh, it also, our data highlights that the pandemic here has been, uh, in the region has been different compared to other regions. It arrived later. It had at least as much transmission as other places, but probably higher than many other regions. But the, the, all, everything indicates that the severity is lower. There is yet a lot of ongoing work with all the samples that we have to try to answer research questions that are specific for the region in terms of the immunological differences, the microbiome, and then also demographic differences, and then also to evaluate the overall impact in terms of collateral damage. So the answer to these questions is key eh, to understand the transition uh, of SARS to, to an endemic stage. And thank you. I, I think I forgot lots of people to thank here. There's lots of people that are part of that, all the departments at the MRC. I just remember at the beginning pushing pressure to everybody, data, data management, statistics, transport, logistics, everybody uh, giving support. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Naroka, for a really interesting presentation. We hear from Dr. Abdul Sisse, who is an assistant professor at the NRC unit, the Gambia Learning School of Higher Tropical Medicine. He's also the head of our genomic strategy. He's going to tell us about the uh, genomics work that he's done in the, in the Gambia. And then after his talk, we'll take all the questions together. Thank you so much. And over to you, Abdul. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers and everyone um, that have been involved with this celebration for the invite to speak about some of the work we've done. There's a little bit of tact in terms, Anna has been talking about a lot of the research a question that's been asked during COVID. Mine actually is quite a simple one because it was actually trying to support um, how we, um, the government, um, the country, respond to the COVID pandemic and using genomic tools. And really, my story um, will start with a lot of people. Anna's talk spoken about the ILI study. We were talking about genomics during the ILI study with Tushan, who is responsible for some of the thought process that So I may forget a few people. Um, in the conversation because this is just a story and conversation but please forgive me because you guys are all important in the story including Martin when we were talking about um, um, you could show um, um, what bugs were affecting and killing those children so those were to specific so COVID was an opportunity for um, my, my talk if you go across the slide from just goes um, what's it called clockwise um, that's my presentation it's where I spend a lot of time in MRC um, um, in UK. So that's where I did most of the, the, my training. And then that would, we would move to the creek. So I have a picture there, but I mean, I would challenge people if they would tell me who are the other three people that are with that poster. And also the time that I was taken, because we've been doing lots of history here. So the time it was taken and where it was actually taken. So maybe at the end of the talk, it's, I've got two questions. That's one of them. So you can tell me. Okay, the mic. Sorry, I was saying Dr. Chan may not, sorry. Okay, so well, let's hear what he does. Um, so I start with the second question. Collaboration equitably in research. Is there a myth or uh, uh, we, we've been doing what MRC has been doing in Gambia and how that impacts people, what the influence that MRC do. So there's two papers that um, came out of COVID that had over 300 African scientists that collaborated 
and together to get two papers out. It was never done before in terms of having so many African scientists sitting down looking at African data. Because at the time, at the beginning, people were saying the data quality that you were getting from Africa was in up to the European standard for COVID. But it shows, I mean, with two highly impactful science papers that we can collaborate and we can actually work together and get really good um, science out of what we've been doing. So that's what I tried to show you that. So, I mean, before um, COVID, it was always very difficult for me to talk about what I do. Um, when you said genomic, somebody would probably come with paternity testing and whatever it is. And also, most of the sick, um, when you talk about genomics again, um, even in Europe, most of the genomics were around human genomics or um, what you do. It wasn't pathogen and genomics. If you had gone to GSAID and look at the number of sequences that were available before COVID, um, and people have been doing influenza surveillance for years um, internationally, but the number of COVID, um, influenza sequences that were available were quite low. But now if you go back now and see the number of COVID sequences that are available publicly in GZ runs in millions because um, the pandemic has changed the, the landscape. And again, I'm going to pick on Alfred. I mean, Alfred's going to talk about a lot of the genomic work he does. But most of those work were not done um, in, the, in, the, in the country or in the region. The samples were taken out. I mean, yes, it's a good collaboration, but most of the work were not done um, in the unit. So the, the unit invested in getting me back. Well, I've been working with Nanopore. So the first 1,000 uh, minion that were available, I wrote a small project, and I got, got one of those. I mean, and I, I brought it over. It's still in the unit. I mean, uh, maybe I stole it from the, the where I was, but no, they gave it to me. So, but it's still in the units. And, um, and really, when we were talking early part of the pandemic, there was a lot of story where the, the, the technology will fit in with um, really um, um, the, the sequencing. Most people, I mean, and we will go back to some of the mistake, we're saying the error rate was too high, um, whatever that they can come up with. But... Um, I think sometimes it's just the understanding of how technology works and what really you, the question you want to answer. And what, what happened is the landscape changed because when we, the pandemic has been going on, there are a few sequences, it was very slow. Um, the Chinese bought 200 uh, min iron. So it changed the landscape saying, well, if that guys can buy min iron and use it for COVID sequencing, so it must be an instrument um, that you could use for genomic disease. So most of what I've been, uh, um, director and uh, Martin, all these people, had a vision, they set up um, Beate, that they wanted to invest in genomics in the, in the country. Um, I happened to come here on holiday for some reason, but it will relate to my, my picture. And actually the first part of it, I was doing training and actually taking samples. So one of the collaboration, the first early collaboration I had with Martin, that sample I took back to, and we did the library here, but I took the sample back to UK and sequenced it and gave them the data. So every year, um, we, we bid um, for equipment. It's, not, um, it's an open bid to every UK institution. And Yes, I've been reasonably successful in the two places I've been before in being able to successfully bid for equipment. And we've been able to add equipment to the facility. So um, it's not like, I'm um, sorry, it's that equity thing. It's not like other African institutions. We're well equipped. We've got state-of-the-art equipment, and we've got people that are eager to learn. And it fits in really well with also where I sit because I think that the technology itself is a tool like your no mobile phone, and most of the kids could use a high technology. Unit had um, we, um, all the platforms, so we also have a huge biobank. I mean, samples um, Andrew will talk about from the nutrition people. I, th I don't know if he's going to go off, but oh, he's saying something about connection, but you could see, but mine is saying something. Yeah, so he was saying I'm going to lose connection. Can we get help from IT, please? Okay. Okay. Oh, control, okay. And we could do this as a TED talk. I can talk with no slides. I mean, I yeah, please go ahead. With that. I mean, so, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, um, really, I mean, what, what are we really the story is that to say that the units um, as the infrastructure, when it comes to what we've been talking about for the last 75 years is that 
the, 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 if you go into the units and look at the platform, there's good laboratories. There's good, I mean, we don't have an issue with electricity. They've been investing on that. And also, we got equipment and MRC, MRC UK now with under. I've always invested really well in the units. So it wasn't like me going to a third world country and trying to set up a facility. It was actually, it was quite an easy transition, so it wasn't cha challenging. I mean, I challenged Umberto a lot of things, but it wasn't for what he provided me with to work. So really, that, that's what was really, really important in actually looking at um, where COVID is. So um, when COVID arrived, we, Tushan and I were talking about, and um, because if you think about um, most of the pandemic, like we would, um, um, Prof was talking about Ebola, People came retrospectively to actually um, sequence the Ebola virus in Guinea and Sierra Leone. It wasn't done in real time. What we, we were proposing is that we could do, and this was something that I bought really early, is that we could do sequencing in real time. So when samples are um, being generated, we can sequence it. So I had this thing that every single um, 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 positive in Gambia, I would try to sequence it. So I didn't know how many it would be. I mean, as Anna said, there were studies where they were talking about how, uh, the projection of how many samples, um, how many posts they But I didn't have that. Um, five minutes left. Okay. Um, allegedly, I've got five minutes left to do this. Okay. I will go through this quickly. Um, yes, yeah, so the unit also had a, a really good networking platform. So we had that and we could um, use that for subsequently for the training. So we're talking about Amplicon sequencing, and we sequenced the first time, um, uh, so we had the first case that um, w was imported in, in the country. Um, I think we sequenced um, quite many of the samples because we thought at the beginning that the sequence will change, the virus will change quite quickly. So for the same individual that we had in Gambia, we sequenced it a few times. And also one of the things we could do with sequencing is that it will, will match what um, the EPI does. At the beginning, if you know where people come from, you sequence them, you could actually say, we could show that, that um, two people um, that came from different areas um, also sort of um, what I would call cluster against where they came from. So it was really easy to do. But actually what the, the, the benefits of sequencing came after when you don't know where people have come from and you're sequencing a lot, could you actually match that data with what's going on? So if you look at the wave, we're now on wave one, two, three, four, five. I think we are on the fifth wave. Um, it's now been dominated by, uh, by Omicron. So we've moved from Omicron 1.1 on the fourth wave to Omicron um, um, 5.1. So he's driving the fifth wave and we're getting samples, although much fewer. And the other thing about quality is that when you go to GSAID and look at, we filter how many genomes. This is, we have actually, this is looking at 4,000 genomes that we've sequenced new. We sequence more than that, but what we do is that we filter those down to the ones that below 10% end. So it's covered at least 90% and um, the genome is covered at a very high coverage level. So, but when you look at across the, the ones that have been filtered in GSAID across the world, the African data sort of matches what you see across the world. So we don't have poor quality data, we can match those data with what happens in the rest of the world. And if you look at the wave, you could actually see that the first wave, because as Anna has explained, was driven by um, local transmission because the borders were closed, you saw those timelines. Second wave, um, um, was actually had a lot of um, importation from Europe because we opened up our borders um, and then um, third, uh, third and fourth ways also have importation from different parts of the world. And this is a mass maximum likelihood showing that we've actually got at least eight clays we can recognize from our data. We've seen at least 51 lineages which has not been shown of that and this is just showing again that the last two waves have been driven by most of the Omicron lineage or sub-lineages. And really what is really important about this slide is to show that we, because we're working with, the, and one of the work, because the ministers mentioned um, what I've done is that um, Umberto has allowed me to work with the ministry since the start of the COVID for 50% of my time. So I said, we helped set up the um, lab um, for the ministry and the ministry has nothing to do with the science we do. It's actually about capacity building, and capacity building the country to do the work that we do. Um, it, we had a small grant and we supported 
um, um, with by in our data science, we're able to really transform the way that the data is shown. But really, just to finish with a couple of slides with the, in terms of capacity building in the region, when you do look at the map of what's going on in the country and in the region, um, we were doing well. And, but really, right at the start, I thought that everybody should be able to do their own sequencing. They should not be sending samples. So at the beginning, WHO and so on set up we were talking to my um, learned colleague about WHO centers. They set up three centers. Uh, we were supposed to send samples to Senegal. But at the time, I was sequencing more samples than Senegal. So for, for one reason, we did not send one sample out from this country. We sequenced our samples. But really what I was trying to show is that we ended up training labs, and I've got colleagues here that we supported for seek, um, actually uh, capacity building, their own sequencing capacity from Nigeria. So all the, the darker gray areas, at some point or the other, I have been to do training. So I go with my team, which I really feel sorry for because sometimes we were going to Bobo de la So I didn't realize Bobo was right, miles right in the middle of um, um, Burkina. I actually thought it was the capital. So I was sitting in the car for seven hours, I realized that uh, Ali Du sent me to right in the bush to go and do work. <laughs> but really, uh, we had a fantastic time there. And really, I cannot complain because I've learned a lot about my um, African and where we do. I have a model. This has been published about what's, um, how we should conduct training. And this is how I conduct training. It's not you go in and you come out. You actually have a process that we follow. And what does epidemic preparedness mean to me? Maybe that's a conduit. You, you build a country and then you move forward. And this is, um, it's on the people from the ministry at the different um, department in the ministry that we've worked with, which I'm really, really proud of that work. And when a man has done what he considered to be his duty to his people and his country, he can rest in peace. I'm not dying, so it's not about <laughs> <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sissi, for a really interesting uh, talk. Now, um, I, I, I'm conscious that we are running about 10 minutes late, so we're going to have five minutes of, of, of questions, if you don't mind, and we'll take that out of our lunch break. So if I may invite uh, Dr. Sissi, please have a seat. And please, uh, it's time for questions for Professor Rocker and um, Abdul Sissi. Thanks. So please, okay, so uh, can, we, can we have the mic, please? Um, okay, please. Um, just want to thank our two presenters for the very insightful presentations. There's a lot to learn. Uh, my question goes to Anne. Um, you indicated that based on your data, the excess deaths were more observed in the neonates in the first month and in the elderly. And you also reported high seropositivity in pregnant women. When you look at your data and the risk factors, are there any factors that really stand out impacting on the transmission dynamics in pregnant women in the Gambia, apart from this being an artifact with other causes of death, especially in the first month of pregnancy? Second question, which is brief, uh, relates to the severe anemia study, uh, severe pneumonia study. Uh, other regions have reported the differences in the pathophysiology of uh, COVID-19 in relation to the evolving um, variants and showing that there is more upper respiratory, upper respiratory tract infections in the Omicron as compared to the other variants. So when you do look at the, since you're able to have sequence in real time, are you having the reduced progression to severe disease and fewer cases of pneumonia because of the evolution of the, uh, of the variants or hybrid immunity or is it the vaccination? How do you explain this? Over. Uh, thanks. I go for the first question, just to say that maybe later we can discuss it further. 
uh, in terms of the excess mortality that I show in um, Basi area, it was under one year, so all the infants together. But then the question about pregnant women is a very interesting one, and I'm happy to discuss it further with Habonato that is here. Uh, we are working on this court of pregnant women. What we have looked at is the seroprevalence, but now we have is, is a clinical court, so we have uh, data that we want to look at the effect on infection during pregnancy on uh, delivery outcome. But this is something that is still ongoing but we can discuss the, the plan of analysis later. For the second question, uh, in terms of the severity, we, one of the things uh, in terms of, we, we have the data on the, um, so we haven't looked into these details, but one of the things that we've seen is that the Delta had most, more severity. So the general surveillance, if you look at the overall data, Delta had higher mortality on the national data. Then uh, with the Omicron, we, uh, we also have data that there was with a very little, um, very few admissions, whether it was because Omicron itself or because people had already been vaccinated or because probably with the data that we show, many people had already gone through at least one or two episodes before the Omicron came. We don't know whether it's one thing or the other. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yes, please, from Ambrose. Thanks very much, the presenters, and, and uh, Abdul Karim, thanks a lot for, for the work that you're doing here in the Gambia. I remember in the early stages of the outbreak when we, uh, we were inviting you at the regional level to do some of our webinars, and uh, we really appreciate. Um, and really, as a commentary, I, I think it's really important um, but it's always very difficult to answer that because what has happened with what happened in South Africa with uh, when they share data and then people start actually using that data against the continent. So it's really important to have that aspect to say that, yes, we would like to share data, but would it affect the way that, and we're thinking that, although I work in a research environment, but the data is public health data. So. One of the things that I, I didn't say is that whenever we sequence, that data is presented to the ministry, the, the, the public health, um, what do we call the policy makers, before even my Umberto sees it. So it's really very important that the data doesn't belong to you. If you are doing data that, that affects a lot of people, somebody has to sanction whether the data needs to be um, available or published, one of the huge problems we have in a research environment is that people want to publish. So the pressure, because the pressure is about getting funds to be able to continue your research, so that pressure needs to be, I don't know whether there's funds available where if you are paying for it, we, we had this conversation, then you could tell me what you want to do with the data. It's really quite important because the researcher, if they were paying for it, they can come back and say, you cannot tell them this. Although most would not say that, but really you need to balance that. So I think in the future, we should advocate that people do data in real time because it helps us. It helps whether the vaccine that we have, even the diagnostic tests that we're doing, some of those tests were not working with Omicron variant. So we need to, people need to know to tell other labs to say, there's no point using this particular kit because it wouldn't work. So I advocate that we should have, but there should be a mechanism to support people, maybe even to compensate some of the research to say, yes, you, you, you've got real-time data, you should publish it. So in the interest of time, I would like to take, um, I've, I've seen several hands, but sadly they're all guys. In the interest of equity and quality, I would like to take one last question from a, a lady. If not, Gordon, you're still a guy, unless you want to. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you so much. I'm really sorry, I forgot about it. Online folks. Is there anyone, any lady online, please? Sorry, I can't see anybody online. Clara Mendes. Okay, please. Yes, yes. She typed. 
Just a question on whether the excess infant mortality during COVID waves could be associated to health systems disruptions such as lower EPI coverage, etc., as it has been reported in other African countries. Can you hear that? I think it's a question for you. Yeah. So you maybe want to go and see. We, we cannot hear it uh, clearly, please. And once we are finishing off, maybe Professor Jimmy, would you want to come to the podium and start getting ready? We should be finishing in the next minute or so, please. So if you want to, because you are chairing the next session. Uh, thank you, Anna, for a very interesting presentation. Just a question on whether the excess infant mortality during COVID waves could be associated to health systems disruption such as lower EPI coverage, et cetera, as it has been reported in other African countries. Uh, thanks, Clara. Um, this is our hypothesis that probably in this age group, this excess is due to disruptions in the health facilities. It happened during the first year. That is when the country uh, closed the borders and everything, and there was a lot of fear in the community and then uh, there were many dis disruptions in the health facilities. Now what we need to do is to contrast with the data from the um, HDSS as well in terms of um, uh, where this woman delivered and whether there was any change in terms of pattern. It's some work that is ongoing in terms of going to the health facilities for uh, infections on the babies. And then I think the others group said have some data on interruption of uh, the EPI vaccinations. So likely is the collateral damage. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry I couldn't take any further questions due to time constraint. But I really want to take the opportunity to thank um, Professor Naroka, Dr. Abdul Sisse for a really interesting presentation. And I would suggest that during the lunch break, you could catch them for further questions. So thank you so much. And I've been reminded that I have to acknowledge colleagues online. And I'm really sorry for missing uh, my colleagues online. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. We'll move to the next session. My name is Jimmy Whitworth, and I'm going to be chairing this session, which sort of follows on from the themes that we've had so far this morning, but broadening out from just COVID-19 to be thinking about emerging infections more generally. Okay, so we've got two speakers in this session, and the first one is David Conway from London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good morning, everyone. So uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for this wonderful meeting and particularly Professor Assanjay for all your hard work in making this happen and for your kind invitation to speak. Um, I'm coming from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine UK and um, I, I see the bottom of the slides is a little bit truncated so um, as I speak I'd like to give acknowledgement at the beginning to some people including whose names uh, are not uh, showing to you, but they're on my slides here. Um, my colleagues at the London School in the UK and colleagues here in MRC Gambia who have 
really helped shape my thinking on this subject and who, all of whom have been actively teaching on the uh, module on pathogen genomics which I coordinate at the London School with my colleague um, Professor Martin Hibbard. So as well as you see Kat, Holt, Martin, Antonio, David Allen, Brendan Wren, the other names are Alfred Amambu Ungwa, Martin Hibbard, Nick Thompson, and others who I'm not mentioning individually. Um, in terms of our understanding of this subject uh, and teaching, we benefit from the uh, engagement and participation of uh, LSHTM uh, staff uh, and colleagues at, in, in MRC Gambia. Um, so when we think about outbreaks and emerging infectious diseases in Africa, we may all have different thoughts coming to our minds, at the top of our minds, and, and for many people, a dominant uh, emerging disease, and certainly currently very important uh, and emerging uh, in parts of Uganda um, in, in an outbreak, uh, as we heard from Prof Kalibu, uh, is Ebola virus. And uh, I'm going to just show you this picture which shows ha a pattern of emergence that we're quite familiar with, with Ebola virus, in that it is a, a, an infection which has a zoonotic origin, comes from fruit bats, and emerges in outbreaks that are separate. They're discrete and independent, um, as is easily seen when a virus is sequenced, and each one of these dots is a, is a virus sequence from a particular individual outbreak, and each of the outbreaks has a different color here, so there's a, a number of sampled sequences. And what we, you're probably familiar with, if, if, in Ebola outbreaks, um, you get all the local uh, transmission is person to person once the, the virus has come from the animal reservoir into a person. And because it's propagation of a, a local viral strain, when they're sequenced, you see those sequences are almost all the same. It's only when the outbreak persists, as happened several years ago in West Africa, in what was the only significant outbreak of Ebola in West Africa, it turned out to be the biggest outbreak of Ebola uh, ever. It's shown in the green uh, towards the right side where there was a lot more infections and as you see that sort of shape showing the diversity uh, in the viral population uh, was, uh, had time to evolve during the outbreak. Um, so that's one type of outbreak. It's one type of genomic epidemiology that's quite simple to understand. We think about many other infections. Um, another one that is commonly considered to be, of, of course, a West African focus uh, and a risk of, of outbreak and emergence is Lassa virus. And here I'd like you to note how very different this is from, from the pattern with Ebola. Um, this is a study done in Nigeria and all the sequencing of viruses from excess numbers of cases in 2018. You see on the, on the right-hand side of this time series, uh, there were many more um, Lassa virus uh, infections, both confirmed and suspected in that year. But sequencing in Nigeria at the African Centers of Excellence uh, for Genomics and Infectious Diseases at uh, a, a university, Redeemers University, that uh, established this center. The sequencing that they did is shown in this phylogeny at the bottom. And you see there, almost all of the infections are different from each other. They're quite unrelated, with, with only a few exceptions. And this is because most of the excess cases was due to multiple independent infections from, from the zoonotic reservoir, which is, in that case, is a small rodent. 
But you will notice that there are a few pairs, in fact, there's just two pairs of infections that are the same, and those are people who are very closely related, and one pair, uh, they were in hospital at the same time. So another form of outbreak that you'll be familiar with uh, and has been studied here is hospital-acquired outbreaks. So now I'm moving to a bacterial example, and this is a study done by Uduak Okomo and colleagues here in the Gambia. And uh, here you see within the Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital, over a fairly short period of time, there was an excess of infections in the intensive care unit, for, uh, particularly among neonates. Um, and so this bacterial infection the, the dots on the right show you the dates when individual infections were, and then the, the uh, tree on the left shows you the relatedness of those uh, whole genome sequences. And um, although I, the, it may be hard for you to sort of see the scale on that, they're all very, very closely related. So essentially, there were a few clusters of um, bacterial populations that was circulating and evolving um, just very recently in that hospital. So we know now this is, this is a hospital-acquired outbreak, but not just one strain, but several strains that were circulating. But other data from the same sequencing allowed investigators to not only understand the transmission, but also features of the antibiotic resistance that they couldn't understand by um, doing any other laboratory tests because antibiotic susceptibility testing often requires quite specialized experience and equipment and sometimes having the viable organism, of course, needing the viable organism to be tested. But genome sequencing in this case was able to show that in this outbreak, many or most of these infections have particularly antibiotic resistant profile, which is, which is really why they were persisting and outbreaking in the hospital. So genome sequencing for these three different kinds of outbreaks you see has provided completely different understanding. Now if we think about the region, and we broaden out to consider what are the risks of outbreaks, what are the risks of emergence? Uh, we might look and see in a particular year, pre-COVID, what has the WHO Afro uh, had to deal with, what, what suspected outbreaks um, have, have been investigated. And there were 150 in this year, 2018. And although I think the print may be too small for you to read all the key, you'll see on the map that there's a lot of red circles and if you can't read the key, that's cholera. Cholera outbreaks uh, may not make the news as much as some of the uh, others that perhaps I've already mentioned and, and others, but they're very common. And of course, the, we're no stranger to cholera outbreaks in the UK, and particularly uh, our main lecture theater at the London School in the UK is the John Snow Lecture Theater. So understanding local outbreaks of cholera and the epidemiology of that is, is embedded in our understanding of infectious diseases research at the London School. So what, why does cholera emerge as a suspected outbreak or, 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 or a crisis that becomes a, a significant public health problem within different parts of Africa? Where does it emerge from? Genome sequencing has shown that in complete contrast to some expectations or speculation and in complete contrast to the other examples I've shown, there is no reservoir of cholera bacteria in Africa that, from which infections pop up and emerge. But this is part of this seventh pandemic of cholera that has been going on a long time within which there are multiple waves of introduction into Africa from outside. And of course, cholera comes originally from Asia, 
and all these waves of introductions have come at various points. So these, these lines show what has been understood through genome sequencing about the relatedness of the strains. And theoretically, if the introductions were stopped, then there would be no more cholera outbreaks in, within Africa. So genome sequencing, we've learned a lot pre-COVID, but I think we're in a new generation now that Dr. Cisse has particularly showcased and, and raised questions for those of us who work on other pathogens to respond to and understand what we should be um, doing to uh, prevent, to study, and to um, engage with other stakeholders in how to reduce the risk of emerging infectious diseases within Africa. And this is a, a figure taken from a paper on which Dr. Cisse is an author, just recently published a couple of weeks ago, and also colleagues in the Uganda uh, MRC and uh, Uganda Virus Research Institute um, are authors on this important paper, uh, including Matt Cotton, who of course used to be here working in virology in MRC Gambia. Um, the map on the left shows you places where SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing has been done in Africa. And it's perhaps more widespread than you may have suspected, and that's because the graph on the left shows the numbers of countries in which that genome sequencing has been done over time. Um, and you see that in 2020, it was less than 10 countries, but by this year, it's more than 30. So how has that happened? What's going on there? And, and when we contrast that with the map on the right, perhaps you'll see better known centers, including here, MRC Gambia, Institute Pasteur, Dakar in West Africa, the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research at the University of Ghana, um, at the, the center I mentioned, um, African Center of Excellence for the Genomics of Infectious Diseases at Redeemers University in Nigeria. These are the four centers that are engaging internationally and regionally as, as centers of experience and excellence. So, so what's the difference between the map on the right and the map on the left? Part of it is that, there, uh, as Dr. Cisse told us, um, it's possible to do some pathogen genome sequencing now in most places using this uh, technology on the right, the Oxford Nanopore um, platform, which isn't so expensive or difficult to get going. But as shown on the left, there's a whole load of other platforms for sequencing which are much higher throughput and which require a much higher level of investment and expertise such as the Illumina paired end short read sequencing, which is to some extent the workhorse for uh, genome sequencing if you need to do a lot of it. And there's a big difference between having a center that can do the one on the left and the one on the right. So most of that growth in numbers of places where sequences, sequencing have been done locally is using the small throughput method on the right. So it's quite distinct. But there's a growing uh, demand, there's a growing opportunity for both. So where, where do we, those of us in the UK, those of us in the Gambia, those in Uganda and elsewhere, where do we position ourselves as, as this, this opportunity grows? When, this is taken from the same paper, when um, we look, uh, or the, the investigators analyzed the proportions of the sequences that were done either on the site, the location where the uh, samples were taken, that's um, the yellow, or at regional centers, as shown on the last slide, within Africa, that's the red, or outside of Africa, that means sending the samples to, to another continent, uh, that's green. See, that's actually quite an interesting mix. This, uh, it's not all skewed just one way. But in some places in Africa, it will be predominantly one, in some places predominantly another. What's the merits or the, the, the benefits? Perhaps looking forward, where should things go? Oops. 
So this is an analysis of, from the same paper, which I think is very useful. And that is that when we look at the sequencing that was done on site, the time between the sample collection to having the sequence ready for sharing, that means submission to a, to a public database, was much shorter. Um, it was only about half the time uh, that it takes if, um, compared to if the sample is, is sent elsewhere. So the green is when it's sent outside of Africa, the red is when it's sent to a, a one of the regional centers, uh, to perhaps in another country. But even the regional centers, on average, give a faster delivery of data and results for, for the broad community. And this uh, now really should be pub public, publicly available data. Uh, you see it delivers better. So there's, there's a lot to be, arg uh, there's a lot of uh, strength in the argument for local sequencing on the basis of, of the turnaround time. Although, as you can see, uh, with everything, there's a big spread in, in, in how long things take within each category. The MRC Gambia, and with colleagues at, in London, like my colleague here, um, shown in the picture, David Allen, who leads um, a research laboratory on, uh, studying viral genomic epidemiology, um, really are able to operate in a way that seems very rare, and that is the agility that the platform here has shown. Dr. Cisse's platform, and together with scientists who work with, with him, have enabled training, as uh, this picture is taken from a, a, a short workshop that uh, David Allen uh, and, and others from the UK were involved in, which actually had to be done in the Gambia at very short notice. And it was planned to be done in Burkina Faso, but for logistical reasons, couldn't go ahead in Burkina Faso a few months ago. So they very quickly relocated to do this in Fajara with colleagues coming from Burkina Faso. And I know how successful that was. And you see this, some numbers there telling you what they were able to do just within the time of the training workshop. And, and highly appreciated by international colleagues within Africa and elsewhere. The other thing that's important to, to note is that not all pathogens have similar kinds of genomes. Um, and one of the dimensions that we need to consider when we think about what could be done in one place or another is the size of the genome. So at the bottom axis is the genome size in numbers of nucleotides. Um, the blue is viruses, the um, red is bacteria, and the green here is eukaryote, eukaryotes. These are any kinds of organisms, not necessarily pathogens, okay, just taken from the uh, NCBI database. You see several orders of magnitude difference in genome size. So if I put on some pathogens here that are potentially emerging, these pathogens all can cause outbreaks. Uh, and I must apologize just for uh, my, my PowerPoint shading uh, made a mistake that rickettsia, of course, is a bacterium, so it should be shaded red, not, not blue, along with the viruses. Um, you'll see that this shows the same, uh, that the viruses that we've talked about compared to um, Organisms with larger genomes, including eukaryotes, that's fungi, malaria parasites, sleeping sickness, all of which can cause local outbreaks. There's orders of magnitude difference in scale as to what, what the information gathering, the data generation needs to be. You're familiar that as scientists, we often put things on a log scale because it looks scientific and impressive and smooth. But it might be more useful if I just put a linear scale on this. Again, apologies for the rickettsia should be red, of course, there. And what you'll see there is that all of the viruses have tiny genomes. They're really extraordinarily small. As, as biologists, medical researchers, we should be shocked every time we realize how tiny a viral genome is. Bacterial genomes are moderate, There's, but they're several, usually several million nucleotides. That's a lot more um, and, and um, of course, eukaryotes like malaria parasites 
are orders of magnitude greater again. So there's a different need for different pathogens. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, and what to study, which pathogens to study, what to put the priority on, has to recognize that different places in the world have different priorities. Even if we take bacterial infections that are causing most uh, morbidity, and particularly that's often linked with having antimicrobial resistance uh, in those bacterial populations. If we look at the, uh, the, s the second cluster here, that's the high income countries, it's uh, dominated by E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus as being most common. If we look uh, to the, the right cluster, that's sub-Saharan Africa, we see that more common than them is Streptococcus pneumonia and Klebsiella pneumonia. So choosing even within bacterial infections which can have outbreaks and particularly related to antimicrobial resistance, the choice as to what organism to study isn't up to us as scientists just to choose because of our own interests. We, we need to respond to what's locally important. And antimicrobial resistance, particularly for bacterial infections, is, is a key feature that's linked to the, the the, the driving of emergence, not only within hospital outbreaks, but within the wider population. And this is just a scheme indicating how this is not only about genome sequencing and analysis on the left, this has to link to understanding of the organism, phenotyping of the organism, understanding how the organism grows, perhaps how it can develop and, and invade cells or escape immunity. So that organism-specific research uh, and capability needs to be there too, and equally important to link that to epidemiology, as we've heard beautifully described by Professor Rocker uh, and, and Prof. Kalibu and others uh, today, that this is not to be done in isolation. So these are capabilities, uh, it may be disappearing off the bottom, yeah, okay. I think you can't see everything on my screen, but at the bottom it's indicating that these capabilities require different disciplines and investment, but this is something that the unit has already committed to, substantively. And internationally, this fits what WHO is recommending for this particular uh, problem of emergence and outbreaks relating to antimicrobial resistance. And internationally, again, the unit already engaging in a regional um, uh, collaboration, the MRC Gemi West Africa collaboration. This is showing some of the work that Martin Antonio and others have done. That the understanding what's there in the population before and after becomes key. And by studying not only within one country but across the network, this um, collaborative project has also been able to join with investigators in other continents to understand patterns that are repeated in different places. And, and here we've got not only, not only microbe, antimicrobial resistance, but vaccine resistance, so serotype replacement after introduction of the PCV13 vaccine and how the bacterial populations shift and evolve in response to that. And importantly here, there's an emergence of a significant subpopulation of Streptococcus pneumoniae that is vaccine resistant and antimicrobial resistant, um, which, is, which is this lineage that uh, in many countries has been sequenced. Now, again, it's invisible because it's on my slide, but cut off somehow by the um, Zoom. So one of the not, not very good things about Zoom is it doesn't show you the whole screen always. Um, this is 25,000 bacterial genome sequences uh, analyzed by this collaborative project. And this is the final point perhaps I want to make about scale, that when you have a large scale of data and you contribute to large scale data generation locally but also collaboratively, there are things that can be done that are perhaps not possible any other way or you wouldn't have thought of. Some of you do microbiome research and you, you generate data um, that are uh, giving you understanding about bacteria, that you didn't even be, go looking for. And this is just a, 
a recent study that shows that when you assemble genomes, bacterial genome sequences from my, microbiome data, um, we sometimes call that metagenome assembled genomes, that's getting the micro, in, individual microbial genomes, pulling them out from the soup of uh, genomes in, in the microbiome data, you can start to do even evolutionary analysis on those individual bacteria. And I think you may not be able to read the small print, but this, this is a test um, of the bacterial populations to show which genes are emerging as being under very strong recent selection um, in those bacterial populations. And, and most of those on the right are uh, multi-drug efflux pumps. And they're mostly in species of bacteria that you or I might not know much about. Um, Bacterioides, Dore, for example, I'm not sure how many of you uh, have studied that before. Um, there are, so there's quite a lot of long names there that would take a long time to read. But what this means is that there's emerging resistance in our bodies, in, in the cells that make up much of our bodies, in species that we don't even know what they are. And the genome sequencing is showing us this and perhaps alerting us to things even before the species have been well described. So this is the power of metagenomics. And, and, and the final example on this slide is that when you have some genomes, they're, they're complex and large, like malaria parasite genomes, the analysis is not going to be done by just aligning sequences and drawing trees. It's, things are more complex than that. There's a lot of recombination in the genome. So other tests need to be used. So Alfred Amambuangwa, um, particularly, and colleagues uh, in collaboration with others, have identified a new uh, gene, uh, or a gene that wasn't understood to be driving drug resistance before, but um, work in the Gambia that Alfred will talk more about as part of his talk tomorrow, I, I think will illustrate the power of population genomics. And the graph at the top shows you that samples were analyzed not only from recent times, but going back in time. And this is another feature, we'd say, archiving of samples, archiving of data at the MRC Gambia, the biobank, is central to be able to understand what's emerging. If you don't know what was there before, you may not know how to interpret what's, what's there today. Um, I won't take any more time because I think I probably, Jimmy, have I, have I done all my time? Okay. It's, it's just the final schemes to say that um, these are taken from viewpoint papers. Um, you, you can't see this is Lancet Infectious Diseases in Zoele et al. Um, last year. Helping us, I think, is a consensus view that uh, specialized centers such as MRC Gambia and the others we, we saw on the map that have already been established, and we hope there will be more over time in Africa, as I think there is a need for more. Um, the epidemiology demands it, I think. Uh, these, these centers have a particular role, but linking into other regional pathogenomics laboratories that might be government institutes or regional institutes, perhaps CDC Africa, and, and others that can, that the next layer to interact with those specialist research centers that, are, that lead, lead the, the subject development, but the re need for regional pathogen genomics laboratories is also there, and perhaps that needs to also be invested in, um, and the relationship between those two needs to be strengthened. And then there's the national laboratories that perhaps even countries that don't have any research on these types of things uh, are, are able to have national data generation using some of the technologies that are, 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 are more available to them. So the link between these different uh, layers and the growth of those, I think, is, is something you're already engaging with here at MRC Gambia, and I think those of us at the London School are, are trying to contribute and think, think about um, as well. And finally, just to say that the, the resources for this type of uh, data and generation data analysis um, has been, has, there's a greater range of resources and networks now and soft, open software that's quite user-friendly 
for example, next strain, I think, has been widely used for those, by those um, analyzing the SARS-CoV-2 um, outbreaks, particularly at the early stage. Um, and then the others here, depending on different pathogens and networks and alliances. But I'd like to just finally plug a network, unashamedly, that um, I think some of you uh, are already convinced is important. And this is um, a network called LSHTM. And um, we know that this is a clunky acronym, LSHTM, but standing for a very long London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. But it's also very familiar and well established here, not least because of the work done here in the Gambia. And in the London School globally, we have multiple centers, multidisciplinary centers, but I've just put seven of, of the 13 centers that we have here that are particularly committed to and relevant for helping us all develop in, in, in our research practice, in our engagement with, with partners and other stakeholders, and, and in making, research, making work on this area translatable and responsive to emerging outbreaks and epidemics. The newest one, I think our director, uh, Prof. Liam Smith, mentioned yesterday the emerging preparedness and response, I think is the newest of those. But the others, some of them like, have been around for a few years, are constantly renewing and um, wanting to adjust our perspectives. So please, those of you who are already involved in those centers, we, we've benefited from that. And if you've not yet been involved in those as part of LSHTM, uh, please, please get involved more because these are resources for us as a community. Thank you. I'll finish there. Thanks. Thank you. I'll take questions after. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, David. I'd like now to call on uh, Jolene Mukaya from uh, the Welcome Sanger Institute to give her talk. Excuse me. Oh. Um, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity, and I'm very happy to uh, be part of this celebration. Uh, my name is uh, Jolene Mokaya. I'm a senior bioinformatician at the Welcome Sanger Institute, working with uh, Professor Stephen Bentley. Prior to taking on this role, I completed my PhD and postdoc from the University of Oxford. The title of my talk today is uh, Application of Biotechnology and Bioinformatics to Define Infection. Yeah, so I was saying the title of my talk is The Application of Biotechnology and Bioinformatics to Define Infection. This talk will be informed by my previous and current research work, which have uh, relied on biotechnology and bioinformatic techniques to analyze data. Um, so I'll begin by discussing my research work while I was at, in Oxford, which focused on uh, tackling hepatitis B virus elimination. I will then introduce my research work at the Sanger, which is on Neisseria meningitis, and then conclude by giving an overview of our bioinformatics training program, which I lead. So to begin, uh, chronic hep B infection is a major global health challenge despite the availability of effective treatment and vaccines. And it is with these interventions in place that the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals aim to eliminate viral hepatitis by the year 2030 by upscaling vaccination, diagnosis, and treatment. However, there are several challenges that are barriers to the achievement of this target. And when we focus on Africa, HEB is highly endemic with about 6% of the population chronically infected. There is a lack of robust epidemiological data to support clinical public health interventions. Lack of resources, poverty, stigma, a high prevalence of HIV in this continent are barriers to the achievement of this target. 
And this here is a real life uh, testimony showing the socioeconomic impact of uh, hepatitis B virus diagnosis. And I'll read one of these. My husband was taking his hep B medicines. Though sometimes he missed a week or so when we could not afford to buy them. More recently, we have not been able to buy medicines and his condition is getting worse. Some health workers seem not to put that into consideration. Some scolded my husband for not taking his medicines and this, and this made me feel so helpless as we've had to try to sell our home produce and animals. But the burden continues to be heavier. I spend most of my time in the hospital with my husband and I've left my children in the care of their grandparents. I am worried that they may not have enough to eat as I am the breadwinner. So taking one step back to understand the cell biology of this virus, Hep B is a partially double-stranded DNA virus of approximately 3,200 base pairs, and its genome is organized into four overlapping reading frames, making it quite a complex virus to study. And very briefly, looking at its uh, replication cycle, upon infection, the virus attaches onto the liver cell by the NTCP receptor, releasing its genome into the cytoplasm, which is then transported into the nucleus, where the partially double-stranded DNA is converted to a covalently closed circular structure, CCC DNA, which forms the transcriptional template for mRNA and pregenomic RNA. In the cytoplasm, the mRNA is translated to viral proteins, whereas the pregenomic RNA is reverse transcribed by the viral polymerase enzyme to form the partially double-stranded DNA, which is then either packaged in the endoplasmic reticulum and then released to infect other cells, or it is recycled back into the nucleus to replenish the CCC DNA pool. The formation and persistence of this CCC DNA is the root cause of chronicity in Hep B infection, and unfortunately, there is no treatment that targets this molecule. The current treatment options, they target uh, the viral polymerase enzyme, therefore inhibiting viral replication. However, these drugs do not lead to re sustained remission or cure. Now, looking closely at the treatment options available, lamivudine has been widely used in the past, but it is currently limited because of resistance. Entecov and Tenofov are the current recommended treatment options for Hep B. Unlike Entecov, Tenofov is cheap and therefore widely available in Africa, has activity against HIV, and can be safely used during pregnancy to prevent mother-to-child transmission. And at this point I ask, how do these drugs work at a population level in driving the elimination targets? So our research group at the time modeled the, uh, the impact of various interventions on the prevalence of Hep B. And what this figure shows is that diagnosis and treatment, which is shown in this purple band, brings down the prevalence of Hep B much quicker compared to all other interventions, including routine neonatal vaccination, which is shown in this blue, blue band. Of course, when you combine all these interventions, you bring down the prevalence much quicker. But a powerful message from this slide is that diagnosis and treatment, which comes at the top in driving down the prevalence of Hep B, relies on antiviral therapy. Now, based on this analysis, I ask, what is the impact of resistance on the current recommended treatment options? Now, this analysis set the scene for my project, where I decided to pay a focused attention on the question of drug resistance, and I started by reviewing existing data. So I carried out a systematic literature review, which describes the frequency, co-occurrence, and distribution of these uh, mutations. I included 40 studies, and what this figure shows, these color dots, shows where these studies were obtained from. And the boxes show individual mutations reported across these studies. The study population in most of these studies were HIV hep infected individuals, and majority of whom were on treatment with lamivudine. An important summary from this work is that there is very limited data from Africa, with certain regions completely unrepresented. As you can see, the north, central, and southwest parts of Africa and the data that I assimilated from this analysis was quite heterogeneous. 
Now looking closely at these individual mutations assimilated from this work, some of these mutations were associated with resistance to tenofovi, entecavi, as well as vaccine escape. Now hep B resistance to tenofovi is quite controversial, where there are studies showing no resistance after several years of using this drug, there is emerging evidence to the contrary. And at this point, I really wanted to understand, does hep B resistance to tenofovi actually exist? And if it does, how does it happen? So I did a second review where I simulated data on the current evidence for clinical or virological breakthrough of hep B virus during therapy with tenofovi. I included 15 studies which use different methods to define resistance, including sequencing the virus obtained from individuals who are not responding to treatment, use of in vitro assays to measure the effect of tenofovi on viral replication, and a combination of these two methods. Hep B resistance to tenofovi occurs in the context of multiple mutations, and these mutations are located within, and these mutation, the most common mutations are position 180, 181, 204, and 236. Another analysis I did was to compare the similarity between HIV and Hep B polymerase enzyme. And I did this because some of the drugs used to treat HIV also have activity against Hep B. And what this heat map shows is that when you compare Hep B genotypes, the similarity is between 96 to 100%. And when you compare HIV to Hep B genotypes, sorry, the similarity is between 25 to uh, 27%. My next analysis was to investigate the structural impact of these mutations. And having shown that there's some degree of homology between HIV and Hep B polymerase enzyme, so using a, a salt crystal structure of HIV, I mapped these mutations onto this structure to infer their mechanistic and structural consequences. Majority of these mutations are located at, at the palm of the enzyme, which is the active site of the enzyme. And when you zoom in, this position 204, which is widely associated with resistance to lamivudine as well as other antiviral therapy, is located spatially adjacent to this gray region here. This gray region here, which is uh, the critical core of the enzyme, which means any changes within or surrounding this region does destabilize the enzyme and its structure, but the virus restores its fitness by acquiring compensatory mutations in other regions. Now, to summarize the past four slides, I show that there is a Hep B resistant to tenofovi does exist. It exists in the context of multiple mutations, and these mutations are located within the active site of the enzyme. So now I ask, does this really matter? And should the knowledge about drug resistance really interfere with wider treatment? So I downloaded 6,000 sequences from a public database to understand uh, the global prevalence and also to infer the genetic relatedness of viruses bearing these mutations. And what this figure shows is that this mutation at position 204, which is widely associated with resistance to lamivudine as well as other antiviral therapy, has a prevalence of up to 5% in certain population, which can indeed interfere with treatment. But when it comes to these other mutations, especially when it comes to their combination, the frequency is much lower and may not interfere with treatment at a population level. This table just summarizes what I've already discussed that when it comes to lamivudine resistance, you only need one to three mutations, and these mutations are clinically relevant. But when it comes to Hep B resistance to tenofovi, as much as I've shown, yes, it does exist, I still think there are gaps in knowledge, and we need more data to support this. Now, looking at the genetic relatedness of viruses bearing these mutations, I generated a phylogenetic tree to look at the distribution of these mutations, and what you can see is that these mutations are randomly distributed, shown in these very dark blue uh, lines, indicating that they are rising independently and then become selected upon exposure to treatment or vaccine. But another, an interesting observation is that some of these mutations did form clusters, which is shown in this red color, indicating an emerging lineage of resistance. But given that I also worked with a small data set, 
We need more data to verify this observation. I also did a cross-sectional analysis of a South African cohort of uh, individuals with a chronic Hep B. And there was this one individual who was HIV Hep B co-infected and has been on treatment with Tenofovir for more than 60 months. And what you can see in this plot is the distribution of his HIV Hep B and liver enzyme um, distribution. So this blue line here shows his HIV viral load, which decreases while on treatment, indicating that he's taking and absorbing drugs. But his Hep B viral load, which is shown in, the, in maroon, is still quite high and detectable. And the yellow and green lines indicate his uh, liver enzymes. And they are elevated, indicating that uh, there is liver inflammation. So in this case, we suspected drug resistance. We isolated and sequenced the virus and were able to identify uh, nine polymorphisms associated with resistance to tenofovir. Now in this case, we have three scenarios. We have a clinical phenotype, an individual whose virus is not responding to treatment. We have a viral sequence phenotype where we've, we've identified mutations associated with resistance, but what is really left is to, under, is to verify these mutations in in vitro assays. So in this journey of understanding drug resistance, the next steps can, can be broadly summarized into three categories. So in vitro assays, trying to measure the effect of treatment on viruses bearing these mutations in cell lines. And then in a clinical level where we need to de develop an algorithm that can guide the clinical management of patients suspected to have drug resistance and more importantly, coming up with an objective way to measure treatment compliance, as well as absorption of treatment in plasma. And then uh, at a population level, monitoring the, and predicting the impact of drug resistance in population over time. So another thing I looked at in terms of drug resistance, I assessed the impact of drug resistance on the cost effectiveness of tenofovir for Hep B uh, PMTCT. Now there is a high risk of mother to child transmission of Hep B in Africa. For example, routine antenatal screening is not done in many settings. There is a delay in administering the birth dose vaccine and an, a number of deliveries do take place outside healthcare facilities. Therefore the opportunity to administer preventative interventions are missed. So an important priority for this continent is to have affordable, accessible, and sustainable PMTCT interventions. So using a hypothetical cohort of 10,000 pregnant African women, we model the cost effectiveness of three different interventions. So the first strategy is um, no pregnant women is screened and therefore no treatment is administered, which is a common scenario in many settings. And then the second strategy, all pregnant women are screened and those who test positive are treated uh, with tenofovir regardless of the viral load. And the third strategy, all pregnant women are screened, but treatment is only administered for those who have a high viral load, which is currently what is currently recommended in the guidelines. The most cost-effective uh, strategy based on this model was that treating every woman despite of the viral load was the most cost-effective. And when we factored in for resistance, of course the number of infants at the age of six months increased, those ones who were infected, and the cost of interventions also increased. But the second strategy where we screen and treat everyone, regardless of the viral load, still remained to be the most cost effective. Now to summarize this analysis, I show there is limited data for Hep B drug and vaccine escape mutations, especially in Africa. These mutations are present but uncommon. I've shown the first evidence from Africa of tenofovir resistance, which was very easy to find in a very small cohort. And there's also need to assess these resistant polymorphisms in in vitro assays. So there's a clear evidence that widespread treatment with tenofovir is safe and effective and an important public health intervention. And in parallel with rolling out wider treatment, there is need for careful scrutiny of drug resistance. And I'm pleased to say that this work has informed the WHO Integrated uh, Global Action Plan on drug resistance for HIV and viral hepatitis. 
And then moving on to the work that I'm doing at the Sanger, I'm interested in understanding the evolutionary dynamics of meningococcus and its impact on the burden of disease and prevention strategies. So meningococcus disease uh, presents major challenges for health systems, economies, and societies. For example, it kills about 250,000 people annually, and those who recover are left with lifelong uh, complications, including paralysis, deafness, amputation, and mental impairness. So the World Health Organization, together with other global partners, put together an ambitious roadmap to eliminate this uh, bacterial meningitis by the year 2030 by improving prevention strategies, response to epidemics, and upscaling diagnosis, treatment, and disease surveillance. Meningococcus disease is caused by Neisseria meningitidis, which is a gram-negative diplococci bacteria that asymptomatically colonizes 10% of the human population. This bacteria is classified into 13 serogroups based on antigen-antibody reaction, and six of these uh, serogroups are known to cause invasive disease. The highest burden of meningitis is in the African meningitis uh, belt, with zero group A accounting for more than 80% of the epidemics. That is before the introduction of um, an A vaccine in 2010. But that, it has now been eradicated with vaccination. But this pathogen still remains to be a major global health threat due to the expansion of non-vaccine uh, serotype, either through serotype replacement or capsular switching, which may undermine the success of public health interventions. Whole genome analysis offers the opportunity to classify closely related strains, those that share an evolutionary uh, history into uh, lineages or clusters. And uh, the Neisseria meningitis population has been classified into 25 major uh, lineages, which indicates uh, diversity. And, uh, sorry. and looking at uh, data from Burkina Faso, you can see that um, lineage 1, and, uh, which is mainly composed of serogroup W, and lineage 2, mainly composed of serogroup X, have emerged or expanded after the introduction of uh, serogroup A uh, vaccine. So the questions that I'm looking to answer is uh, I want to understand what maintains diversity within the Neisseria meningitis population after vaccination, and is it possible to predict the fitness and invasive capacity of expanding or emerging lineages before a vaccine is implemented? So I know there is the men A, C, Y, and W, which, which is soon to be rolled out. So is it possible for us to think ahead and see how will the bacteria change after the introduction of, of this vaccine, and how can we inform uh, policy on the best way uh, possible? And then also, uh, host and bacterial factors uh, that determine colonization or invasive disease in uh, Neisseria meningitis are not completely understood. So what I want to do is to perform a genome-wide uh, association study to determine the contribution of uh, genetic variants in explaining disease or courage. And I'm also interested to assess the, imp as to assess the, uh, the effect of this uh, isolates on the global gene expression in respiratory and endothelial cells using uh, high-throughput RNA sequencing. And then now to finalize, I will uh, give an overview of our bioinformatics uh, training program. And I'd like to begin by reflecting on the, um, on the situation in Africa. We've already seen that there is a high burden of disease in this continent. And really, we need uh, modern science, technology, and innovation to tackle these uh, challenges. And also, we've seen that over the past a few years, there has been massive progress in the field of genomics. For example, the cost of sequencing has drastically decreased, and also by informatic tools and codes are becoming more accessible and reproducible. But really, what is left... Um, okay, I'm not sure what's happening. Could you come on? Thank you. 
Hello, Omar. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so what I was saying is what is really left in the African continent is to build expertise, bioinformatics expertise, where we can have the skills to generate, analyze, and interpret our genomic data. Mm, sorry. No working anymore. It's frozen. Yeah, so our research group uh, focuses on three important uh, pathogens, and we've established a global su surveillance network which provides uh, evidence for disease prevention and disease control, and we have collaborators from more than 100 institutions uh, globally. And really an important priority for us is to strengthen the capacity of our project collaborators in generating and analyzing genomic data. So based on our training needs uh, assessment, we were able to assess the experience of our collaborators in using our sequencing technologies and bioinformatics software in generating, analyzing, and visualizing genomic data. And based on this, we came up with two modules, a fundamental module which prov um, provides a, a basic exposure to bioinformatics analysis using our free online tools and this has already been uh, completed. And now our next step is to deliver an advanced module where we're able to introduce our uh, research collaborators into using uh, command line in analyzing and uh, visualizing uh, data. So the advanced bioinformatics uh, training program, the aim is to use genomics approach to track transmission antimicrobial resistance in streptococcus pneumonia and streptococcus agalactia. And our target audience are early career researchers working in low and middle income countries. So just to give you an overview of this uh, module, uh, we hope that at the end of the training, our participants should be able to extract and prepare sequencing libraries for next generation sequencing, perform NGS data control, assembly, reference mapping, and in silico characterization be able to understand how to develop a portable bioinformatics pipeline and also carry out a downstream phylogenetic analysis. We plan to deliver this training in four countries uh, early next year, including the Gambia. And I'd like to acknowledge Martin Antonio, who's really helping us uh, in setting this up and delivering this training. So far, we've already selected 85 participants uh, globally, and those will be coming to the Gambia uh, from all over Africa. In terms of training, we have local trainers, so we'll have trainers from the MRC Gambia, as well as from the Welcome Sanger Institute. And in terms of our sustainability plan, we have a Slack channel uh, read, available where our participants can be able to ask questions and will be continually supported with analysis. Uh, thank you for listening. I think that's the end. I'd like to acknowledge all the people who put this together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to both of our speakers. Um, can I open the floor for some questions? Yeah, we have a question over here. Hello. Yeah. 
Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I'm more interested in the hepatitis data that you have. Um, I know that the uh, covalently circular, circularly closed DNA seems to be the most um, important or the most essential part of the life cycle of the virus in still being in the patient or in the host. Um, the analysis that you did, did you find any genetic markers in the parasite that seems to facilitate or confer um, that mechanism to the parasite? And also, did you analyze any data on the host to see if there are any genetic factors in the host that facilitates that mechanism? Thank you. Yeah. So that's an easy answer. No, I did not look at uh, the host, and I did not focus on the CCC DNA. So my focus was on the viral polymerase enzyme, and that's where the current treatment options uh, they target. So yeah, I did not focus on that, neither on the host. Thank you. We have a question towards the back. Thank you. Um, so I. My mine is really a comment about uh, the building genome sequencing capacity. Uh, both uh, uh, Karim and uh, Dave uh, talked about the importance of this, and uh, Dave underscored the fact that uh, doing sequencing locally is very um, helpful in terms of the turnaround time to getting uh, results. Uh, but I think uh, one aspect that uh, we haven't talked about here is the uh, the uh, access to reagents and the cost involved um, so yes if you have reagents then it is much faster to do the sequencing locally uh, but we know that it's very difficult to get reagents and the costs are at least 50 percent 50 to 100 percent higher than uh, the real cost of these reagents when we buy them from the continent and I think that unless there's a, uh, a, you know, a better arrangement with um, Illumina, for example, uh, and Illumina are probably the, the worst corporates in this, uh, where they have really left the continent on our own in terms of uh, uh, you know, living, at, living us at the mercy of their agents who uh, you know, gouge us for uh, exorbitant prices and uh, provide very poor uh, service in terms of uh, maintaining the equipment. Uh, unless we address these um, issues on the whole, I think that um, genome sequencing on the continent will continue to be a difficult, um, uh, you know, uh, exercise because uh, the cost per sample is really not sustainable, and and the turnaround time is affected by um, the reagents. If the time between ordering reagents and receiving them, and if you're lacking in good condition, is, is really a big challenge. So I think that uh, we need to include this in this discussion, uh, whilst it's good and, and encouraging that sequencing capacity is growing on the continent. I think there are some realities that uh, need to be addressed for this to be sustainable. Thank you. Any response to that? <laughs> I mean, it's a question, Maura. Yeah, thanks for that comment. Mm -hmm. I agree with your sentiments. And for me, I want to pose to, the, to Africans, we need to like, develop our own companies where we can you know, generate these uh, reagents locally instead of having to depend on other countries to ship them. That really slows our progress. How can we start thinking of creating these things for ourselves? We need to talk with our government. I know it's quite complex, but I think that is for me, I think that's what we need to, to, to think about and, and do. That works. Great. Um, building on that, I'd, I'd just like to ask about what your thoughts are about sequencing in outbreaks. Um, very often, speed is important to be able to, to act to respond to that outbreak. Um, and if you've got things like minion, which can be near patient, near, 
near real time, but are not as accurate as something like um, Illumina, but that takes longer and so on. What do you think is the best strategy for using sequencing for action during fast-moving epidemics? So for me, what I, the first thing that comes to mind is really training people to be able to do this kind of sequencing real time and very quickly during uh, epidemics. I'm glad to see a lot of presentations where we have these uh, platforms available. We have Nanopore, we have Illumina in, in many African settings. And really for me, it's the skills that we need and expertise and not just generating data, but also analyzing and interpreting these things locally. So my passion is to make sure that uh, a lot of us Africans are trained in, in uh, uh, bioinformatics skills. Yeah. And I think that um, Dr. Sise uh, certainly is better um, experienced and qualified to answer beyond that for the perspective of what facilities, what platforms um, we, here in the MRC Gambia and perhaps in West Africa. Uh, I wonder if um, Abdul Karim would like to comment and answer that further. Or is, is he having a rest? He stepped out. <laughs> Nice try. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions? Umberto. Yeah, maybe I would like to ask a question about uh, what's next after training, you know, because, uh, you know, you train people, but then they go back to their institution. Uh, maybe there's no enough computing facility, I don't know. I mean, but is there anything that you think should be done after the training in terms of follow-up? Thank you. So the kind of uh, participants we selected are those who are actively generating and analyzing data. They work in laboratories that these uh, resources are already available. So we are hoping that they, they'll now just have the more capacity to be able to, to work with what's available. Um, and what's also important for us is that when we look at the applications, people have to convince us how this will advance their career. So also thinking within themselves how they want to take this forward on their own, but also importantly, how are they going to uh, help people within their group or institutions? So those, those are the kind of conversations we are looking to have with uh, our participants. I don't think I can solve that on my own. I think we need to have all this, these continuous conversations and about how do we take this forward so that it's just not, it ends with the training, but it's actually something that is sustainable. So, Jimmy Abdul is here to answer the question. Thank you very much. Um, we found him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, what I was asking about is in outbreaks which are fast moving where there's a real need to get uh, sequencing to actually be useful for, for the outbreak and for, for um, uh, making sure that it's contributing to the direction in which that is going. What do you think is the, the best strategy and the best approach between using, say, MinIron for, for fast results as opposed to Illumina, which is going to be slower, but give you something that is more accurate. Where, where do you see the balance lying there in the African context? Okay, I think um, what David, can you hear me? Um, what David alluded is that um, there's no one size fits all, but I think what is important is about um, making sure um, there is a capacity that being sustained in whatever region that you do. So whether we're using um, the hubs, the regional um, center of excellence, or local, um, which is, um, or, or local um, uh, in sequencing capacity, 
And we, we've spoken about trying to build national public health um, labs to be able to respond to this. But actually, one of the difficulty with that is that if they don't have a research um, component, they can't sustain or maintain that. Because when we were talking about Ebola, um, all the, the um, cholera, all the outbreaks before, Sierra Leone had sequencing capacity. Guinea had sequencing capacity. But then we come back to COVID, they're not there. So what happened in between? So, I mean, so that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Even if we, 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 we open a lot of sequencing facilities, if they're not doing something, you lose the staff. You lose the, the, the um, so we need to have a balance. There's the balance is in fact where how we, we balance that comes from policy makers and the guys with the money um, to decide how we go forward. Excellent, thank you. I think that's a really useful insight. Okay, question at the back. Yeah, thanks. Th thanks very much, David and uh, Jarlene, for the presentations. I think they were really fascinating and, and touched on a very important aspect of um, use of genomic data, as exemplified by several things that Dave has shown and what uh, Abdul has shown and others as well. I was just going to go for, for Dave um, to start with. As you, you've talked about extending our portfolio and targets for sequencing to even more important pathogens um, in Africa that up to now have not been looked at and, and that, that have the potential to cause outbreaks and actually are causing outbreaks. The question now is, should this be left just to researchers to go and find the funding to do it? Because up to now, it's only mostly researchers. This is going to the public health domain. So how, what do we do to change the strategy here um, to get our public health institutions and those who are in power more interested to support these sequencing ventures. And the second question, of course, to Joylin is, we're struggling to have guys in bioinformatics. There's always the talk about gender balance. So it's, it's always a pleasure to see um, a female bioinformatician um, not just doing regular stuff, but really doing very important bioinformatics research. Um, do you have in place um, schemes that can encourage more female bioinformaticians to come up and to stay in the continent, not just to do the science out of the continent, but to stay in the continent. Because we are struggling to keep guys. Maybe we, we actually might do better by training more females in the continent to do bioinformatics. Thank you. Um, I know the first question was not directed to me, but I'll try and answer. In terms of working with policy, I think us as researchers, we need to market our work and make sure how important it is, just banging on their doors and telling them that this is important. I think that would make them interested in what we are doing and hopefully fund us. That is how I think. Um, in terms of uh, bringing more people into bioinformatics training, that's one way, and retaining I'm really pleased to see what uh, the MRC Gambia is doing with the retention pro program, which I thought is fascinating, where people are trained, but then they tend to come back or are doing amazing things elsewhere. But also what is, I think personally, is that as Africans, as much as Africa, we need to you know, do a lot of work in our continent. I think we also need the freedom to do amazing things anywhere, you know, the, um, I think we need to have the opportunities to make an impact. If I'm a Kenyan, I can make an impact in the Gambia, I can make an impact in the UK, I can make an impact in the US, I can, uh, these opportunities are available to our, uh, our colleagues who are non-African, they can travel anywhere and do research anywhere. I think also Africans should have that opportunity to do research anywhere because we are talented. What an excellent note to finish on. Um, so I'd like to thank both of our speakers and uh, those of you uh, who 
raise questions here for uh, a most interesting session. So thank you all very much. And now just before we uh, break and go for lunch, Asan wants to try to get us together for a photograph again. Yeah. So, so ka, ka, now we can go in front to have the photo before we move upstairs for the lunch. You need to block the stairs. <laughs> yes. so, Someone needs to the, block the, the photo stairs. is in front of the building. The front. The front. The entrance. The entrance of the building. That's where we'll have the photo. Yes, the main entrance. The main entrance. Recording stopped.